Okay, so first thing you need to do when you're cleaning your machine is take it apart. Pay attention to how you remove everything and keep all the pieces together that belong in certain areas. This is a little difficult to do as I'm doing it backwards from what I'm used to doing it so that you can see what I'm doing. Slide this sideways to slide it off. And this little plate sideways, you can see the gears. And now you can see the inside. Not very well though. You can see the inside. Okay. You'll also notice that on this piece, there's a little nub here. People often put these on backwards when they put them back in. It goes on the inside, because if you leave it on the outside, I've seen machines end up like this. That is not going to allow you to adjust your stitch. Okay, now I'm going to take off the access panel and the light on the back. This machine is probably dirty because it was due for cleaning. I hadn't done it yet. Okay, there's a screw just like on the front, but I think it's a little different. I don't think it has, well, no, oh, it's the same. I still keep it separated. You unscrew it. And this little plate comes off. On some machines, if there's a light, the light comes off. And then you can see all the way through. There's also an access panel back here underneath the flywheel. I'm going to talk a minute for, for just a minute about the motor. This screw here, when you have your belt on, which I need to put a new belt on this thing today, when you put your belt on, if you loosen the screw, this whole bracket goes up and down. You want just enough tension on your wheel for the wheel to turn. If you have it too tight or too loose, you're not going to have a good stitch. You're going to have a hard time. And it, it's going to be very frustrating. Sometimes the simplest fixes are the easiest fixes. There's also on this machine, I don't know why, and I haven't taken the time to figure it out because it works. It works for me, so I don't do anything different. This piece of cardboard came in this machine. My sister picked it up at Goodwill. It came in the machine like this, and when I was running it for the first time to see if it worked, I didn't do anything cleaning-wise. I turned it on, plugged it in, and it sounded a little rough, but it worked pretty well. So when I got ready to clean it and take it apart, I took the cardboard out and when I started it up, oh boy did I notice why it was there. It was very, very loud. There's something about this motor that vibrates and I'm not sure what the problem is yet. As long as it works, I'm not going to mess with it. I'm, I'm sure it has something to do with how it's mounted to this bracket here, but it's very loud so I just leave that cardboard in there. It works great. It's a little loud because some of these machines are a little loud, but it, there's nothing to fix if it's not broken. This is your motor cord. I realize that it looks kind of scary underneath. As long as everything is intact and put together and you don't have children plugging this in, I don't think there's a problem. Okay, we've got the back access, access and the front access off. Now we're going to turn it around, if I can get some of my things out of the way, and take off the faceplate. 
I love this faceplate. I think it's beautiful. It's like the diamond ring of your machine. You don't need to take this one completely out. You just need to loosen it enough to push it up through that hole and off. Now your tension assembly is on here. Um, it is recommended to take these off and clean them. I have to be honest, I've never taken one apart. I'm going to though soon. I have a machine downstairs that I've completely torn apart to see if I can fix it. I think it was in the water. This one is a little dusty. I'll show you how to clean in between where the thread goes to make sure that your tension will be okay. One of these days, maybe I'll go through how to take it apart when I learn. All right, so here's the front. As you turn the wheel, you can see how the little gears and things in there work. Going around and around. It looks a little dirty too, but maybe that's just the angle on the camera. But you can also see in through here, that gigantic screw holds this on. Okay, and then this face plate pops off at an angle. See those little brackets underneath? It's easier to clean and everything taking that off. And then we're going to take, we'll take the foot off so you can see a little easier what's going on down in here. I'm not going to remove that screw. And I want to take the face plate off. And I know some of this may be scary if you're not mechanically inclined, but I guarantee you it's not that hard. Just take your time, keep all of your screws in a place so that you don't lose them or you don't forget where they go. Sometimes on eBay you can find parts that are in better condition that will fit. Even though this is a Sewmore, it is a Singer 15 clone. And I know it's a 15 and not a 201 because of this bobbin configuration. 201s lie horizontally in the machine. These are vertical. Uh, you can free motion on both, but I've heard that 15s are way easier to do your free motion on. Okay, I'm going to tip this up so you can see. My baby girl is dirty. Now, if you've got one of these out of the attic, it's all rusty or gunky and it's not working well, there are screws there that you can see when you take it apart that you can remove and pop off this feed dog. I'm not going to do that today because there's nothing wrong with mine. Man, I do have a dirty machine. We are, however, going to take off this bobbin assembly. Some of them have different little screw thingies here. These pull out and move. I think the screw is just to hold on the little wheel. But they all, if they look like this, they all hold the same way. Now this thing is just going to fall off. You can see what it looks like on both sides. I don't know the technical names for this stuff. I probably should, but I don't. This little guy comes out. Then you're left with this. Now, you don't have to take anything else off. It's pretty much down to the bare bones. If you want to use compressed air, feel free. I don't think it's going to hurt anything. I don't think it's necessary. I do use an old toothbrush. And I go in there and scrub around. Now, like I said, if you need to, you can take off the feed dog. I don't think I need to. I also have an old Singer brush. It's awfully bright in here. That goes in there and digs out some of the pieces that you can't necessarily get to. Also, when you're cleaning the whole machine, um, remember oil removes oil. So if it's very dirty on the machine and you want to get some of that nasty gunk off, the best thing you can do is 
put a little bit of sewing machine oil on your rag and just wipe it away. It might take a little bit of elbow grease to get it off. This machine was very dirty when I did get it. Even though somebody had taken pretty good care of it, I still had a lot of uh, polishing up to do. And when you're done, some people like to use a hard car wax on it. Like this bed is a little bit scratched here in places. It's like stretch marks. I think it's just part of the charm of the machine. As long as it's in pretty good condition, I wouldn't really do anything to it. Okay, now that we've got all this apart and we're cleaning all the gunk and garbage out, brush it out really good, then you're going to take... This is an old bottle of sewing machine oil I have. They last forever. It's a Singer brand. I think I bought it in the 90s. It's almost empty, but not quite. But it's, it's a little dirty. It's oil. Who cares? I also wanted to show you... Ah, there it is. For these old guys, you're going to need something called lubricant. Not very much. The end of mine popped off. I'm too frugal to throw it away, so I just put a little tape over the end. We'll use this in a little bit. I probably won't put it on, but I'll show you where to put it. This stuff will last you forever. You're not going to need a whole lot. Eventually, you may want to get an oiler like this. It has a long nozzle here to fit down into some corners that you can't necessarily reach. When you first do your oil, after the machine has been setting for years and years, you need to use a lot of oil to get it moving, to get it clean. But after time, you're only going to need a little bit. You don't want to get too much oil in it because then you're going to see things dripping here and there. You could possibly get it on your fabric. It's just not a good idea to use a ton of oil after the machine is in working condition. But today, I'm going to show you how I would do it. I'm going to put a little bit of oil in this area with my finger. Generally, if metal is rubbing metal, you want to oil it. This piece here is dirty on the back. I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to wipe it off. Make sure everything is off of it. If you keep these machines clean and oiled, they will last you. They'll probably be heirlooms for your grandchildren and their grandchildren. I don't know yet. Or whomever you may want to pass it down to. Okay, this little guy, there's a little bit of gunk on the outside. I've only had this machine a few years. I've never used it a whole lot. Basically, she was my backup when my Husqvarna Viking was in the shop. I love my new machines, but nothing is like an old girl. Okay, we're going to brush all that off. Make sure the inside is clean. You don't need to oil the inside. The inside is not to be oiled. That is where your bobbin's going to sit. Okay, let's see if I can do this backwards. It just sits in here. First of all, let me show you. That thing right here, watch, I'll turn it a little bit. See how that thing in there moves? This is going to sit opposite of that. So I'm going to bring it, the lever up in the highest position. And this should sit right in place. <laughs> oh, and it's going to make a liar out of me. This isn't easy to do backwards, let me say that first. Alright, I'm going to have to turn it towards me to get it in.
Okay. It is in. Let's get a good look. All right. Now this. There's this side. It's kind of smooth, and there's this side. It has the little cutout here. That is the back side. That goes towards the machine. So you can see the top. The smooth, flat side is what goes on the outside. And it just pops into place. And you're going to take these little levers and move them back into place. Okay. Now I'm going to put the feed dogs on, or the, not the feed dogs, the uh, stitch plate cover. One of these days, I want to find one of these with markings on it. This one is an old fashioned one, doesn't have any markings, kind of like to see where my markings are. I don't know if you can see the tape residue, I usually put a piece of tape on there for the quarter inch or the five eighths, whatever I'm sewing that particular day. You can use metal polish on this if you like to get it nice and shiny again. I haven't taken the time to do that. But it just pops back on. Oh, I wanted to show you another feature too. If yours has a knob like this, feed dogs drop. Some of them drop incrementally. Like a friend of mine just bought one the other day. I believe hers has three settings. All the way up, halfway down, all the way down. If you have trouble putting this back on, you can drop it. I wouldn't see why you'd have trouble. It should fit perfectly, actually. <clears throat> I have four dogs who are very, very quiet today, and I'm really surprised. They usually want up on my sewing table. They like to look out the window for their daddy. Okay, we're going to put this back down. I recommend having your own set of tools. I have pink tools, actually. Pink is my favorite color. If you can see, all the stuff around me is usually pink. I'm usually wearing pink. Heck, I'm even pink. Of course, you haven't seen me until now. Hi. Okay. So that's all in. The plate. Some of these are different. It's going to depend on your make and model as to how this goes back in. With these spring tip things, I'm going to angle it. Stick the one side under. Try not to scratch the bed. And work it until you get the other side in. Snap it in place. And it just goes back. Uh, some of them are connected to this stitch plate. And in that case, you just unscrew these screws and they come right off. Those are generally the ones that lift up. When they slide out like this, they usually have this kind of connection. All right, so now we're going to do, excuse me, the front part here. Now, if this has been setting in an attic for a really long time, what I recommend is you oil the crap out of it. If you're going to do a lot of oiling, you might want to do this to catch some of the oil. You want to scrape out, scratch out all the gunky grimy, goopy mess. Please never use three-in-one machine oil on your machine. Please always use something that is intended for your machine. Sewing machine oil. Other type, type, types of oil are going to leave a residue over time that is going to be really hard to get out and is going to gunk up your machine something awful and you may end up having to soak it in stuff like kerosene. It's not hard. So we're just going to use regular machine oil. This, people, is a pressure valve. You press on it for the amount of pressure you want your foot to come down. A lot of these are different. Play with it a little bit. You're not going to hurt it. Figure out what your pressure is that you want for your foot to hold on on your fabric and use that. You're not going to oil the top of that. You are going to oil this thing. Mine has a little piece of fluff in there. I'm not sure what kind of fluff it is or if you should replace it at all. But it runs down through here and lubricates this bar. This is your needle bar. You need it to be oiled well. 
this thing is going to move up and down really fast. If you're really good at it, it's going to go forever. It's going to go always. I'm going to put some oil in the top of that. Now, just because I'm cleaning, I'm going to put a dab of oil here. Oh, I got too much. That's all right. We're going to wipe it off. You're going to uh, turn your wheel. See how you can see there's some metal there. There's some metal in there. This is where the, um, the pinpoint oiler comes in handy. Just turn it. Of course, we're doing this without any thread in the machine and the bobbin case out. We're going to turn it and look to see <laughs> look to see what all is moving and where we need our oil. Now I'm going to oil this just because it's metal on metal. Put a little oil in there. Okay. I can see some oil running down the front of my machine. You might want to uh, give it a once over before you go back to sewing to make sure everything is cleaned on it. Alright, I was going to put my foot back on. There it is. When you store these guys, um, to lengthen the life of your springs it's best and I don't know if some of you have done this or seen this put some fabric underneath here and lower that so that there's not any pressure of it holding it up I don't know if it does any good I don't know if it really matters I just like to take precautions sometimes if it makes sense to me it makes me sleep better at night but anyway um, Wipe off the excess when you're done. Looks good. I'll turn it around. Um, maybe dust around in there if you need to. Mine does not need it. When you first pull these out of the attic or garage or wherever they've been stored or you don't know where they've been stored and you're doing a good cleaning, I recommend putting oil around that screw there so that when we do our hard run to get it good and oiled and freed up that it will work better. I want to take some time to point out while we're here at the front of the machine, let's see if I can angle this without dropping it, there are holes. There's one hole here, 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 and a few back here. And, and right there. These are oiling points. Now you can get a 1591 Singer manual to show you how. Or you can get a generic one if your machine didn't come with one. These are oiling points. They need to be oiled when you do uh, just a basic oiling. Today we're going through um, a thorough cleaning. You don't necessarily have to take all these parts off when you do your oiling. The machine, the uh, manual will tell you how. But you're going to want to, when you do your regular oil, put a drop there, a drop there, and a drop there. Back here, you'll do the same thing. There's one there and one there. Now, some machines have another oiling point along this area right in here. Mine doesn't. I think it's the newer brands that do. I think maybe a 201. I'm not sure. I don't have a 201 at the moment. That's next on my list. Not all holes are oiling points. I don't believe either one of these holes on the bed is an oiling point. I think that is just for your uh, seam guides and different attachments. So, we've got the front part done. The tension discs. You want to take a uh, maybe a piece of uh, cotton string with oil in it and go through here to take out all the gunk. I don't necessarily need to do that because this has been clean. But you can pull these apart and look and see how it looks in there. If it looks clean and smooth, there's nothing to worry about. 
It needs to clamp onto the thread to make your tension work. If there's stuff in there, or if it's a little rusty, it's not going to work properly. So my tension is okay. Um, about the only thing I ever really see that need replaced on these things are the spring. It's pretty delicate. You want to make sure that you have one on there. It's important. All I'm going to do is slide it back on. Oops. Put it back in its proper place. That's only one thing that secures it on there. Just that one screw. And tighten it down. Make sure it's not going anywhere. <sighs> New coffee. Okay, now my diamond ring is back on my machine. I'm going to come back here to the back side. Or the front side, I'm sorry. Inside here. Remember what I said before? If you see metal on metal, oil it. See how things in there move? I'm not going to do it necessarily because my machine has been cleaned and is working pretty well. Um, If it's really, really, really dirty, and it's running hard, and it's not like butter when you move this wheel, if you can't move it with your pinky, take some of this lube. Hopefully yours has a tip. And inside here, there's like a little U-hook. It's like a fork, kind of like, like a piece fork, that runs up and down that metal piece. So you take this tip and try to fit it in there, or use your pinky and get it in there, and just smear a little bit of lube on the inside of that so that the fork glides smoothly. The oil also helps clean up whatever crap is in there, and usually there's a lot of crap. So you want to make sure you dust in there really well, use your brushes, use all kinds of brushes to get in there and clean off the gunk, canned air if you choose toothbrush. Excuse me. Get in there and scrub it off. Once you have that done, then it's time to put the uh, stitch plate back on. I usually like to put my stitch lever in a neutral position. Let me see if I can remember how to do this right. Sometimes it takes me a moment. I believe that it goes on like this. Remember, your flat side is on the outside. Stick it on sideways. And it should fit in just like that. I know the sunlight's hitting it kind of funny. So that the... Oh, I know how to tell. This nut that sticks out it goes on the side where your screw is that adjusts the stitch length. And that's how we tell. I'm a little slow in my old age. It takes me a moment. I'm going to stick it on like that. And you're going to put your plate on. Remember, go at it sideways and turn it. Now is a good time while you're holding it down. Well, you could do this. Some of these can be tricky if you don't do it in this sequence. I tried once to put the inside plate and the outside plate on at the same time. Boy, was that a mistake. It took me a little bit. I don't know if you all know how hard this is to do backwards. It's a little difficult. Okay, I have it started. Now, uh huh, that's why. I'm going to move that plate a little bit so I can see where the hole is for this guy. I think you can see it. See how you have to have that 
screw hole then. Mine was down here. I couldn't reach it. <laughs> oh, what fun. All right. You don't want this all the way tight because we're still going to make some adjustments. But it's in there. It's together. I'm going to put my other screw in the bottom. Must see, right? Watching me put in all these screws has got to be a good time. My husband and I took apart a machine that my sister thought said commando. That really made me laugh. It's a commander. I believe it's a Sears and Roebuck machine. That is a 15 clone. It looked as though it had been sitting in water for a long, long time. And I've been wanting to paint one, so I thought it would be fun to take one apart and see exactly how it works. I found last night an adjustment manual that will tell me how to put it back together again. So we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, this lever all the way up is reverse. That's how you go backwards. That will keep you in one spot. The farther down you go, the bigger your stitches become. I generally like to keep it between 12 and 10 for piecing purposes. Once you have it adjusted where you want it, you tighten the screw down and it won't move. Now, you can't make it smaller, but you can go backwards to do your reverse stitches. This bobbin wheel thingy here, once you put, let me find one, There's a notch inside your bobbin. I believe this is a class 15. It's either 15 or 66. I think it's a 66. I don't remember. Anyway, there is a groove here on the bobbin winder that's going to fit in the groove in your bobbin. You spin it around, you can feel it. Then this pops down. Your thread comes from the spool pin, goes down underneath of this guy here, which you may want to take apart and clean. It's just held on by a screw. And then it comes back up to here. This wheel rides on your flywheel here. And that's what turns the bobbin. When it's full, it pops up so that the wheel is no longer engaged. Now, when you do that, you do need to turn this so that it's unlocked. So it should spin this wheel without moving this wheel. I, sh I should say it should spin this wheel without making this go up and down. And when you're done making your bobbin, then you tighten it back up again. Okay, we've got the front on, now we're going to the back. You can remove this motor to clean the bed of the machine, or clean around the machine. You will notice that over a period of time, there'll be like a little black teeny weeny bumps all over the bed here. That is because these motors throw a little bit of oil. It's not a lot, but it is enough to make a bit of a mess. I don't recommend keeping fine silks and silk threads stored behind this machine. You will be very, very sad. You can take this off. You can adjust it up and down according to what you need. Now, I had to take a belt off of this one for another machine that I sent to a dear friend in Louisiana. Well, she's becoming a dear friend. I don't really know her all that well yet, but she's a sweetie. Um, we're going to want to pick up something like this. So I machine belts. It's a generic. Most of the time, that's what you're going to need. Um, if you have a newer one, it's probably going to require one of those belts that have the teeth in it. 
you can tell by the gears and the wheels, this is smooth. This area up here is smooth, so I need a smooth belt. If they require the belt with the teeth, you'll see that on the gears. Now it comes with one of these guys, and mine does not need replaced yet, so I will keep it, just in case it will. But I have to steal a belt from this one for another machine. So this one needed a new belt. Let me see if I can do this backwards. Now I've unhooked on my belt, and it's all curly and stuff. That doesn't matter. I'm going to slip it around the wheel, and it will fit into the groove that is inside of the wheel. And I would show you that, but I don't think you could really see it. Once you get it in there, and it's in that groove, you're going to kind of stretch it down. Sometimes if you have a hard time stretching it, you can turn the wheel and get it started, and it will just keep going on. But now my uh, new belt is installed, and it looks like it's going to work great. Okay, now we're going to go back to the light. I don't really like this light. And one of these days, I'm going to get real serious about finding a replacement in LED form. You can find these kinds of flashlights with all the LEDs. They're very bright. You can find these with a magnet. Or you can get creative and, I don't know, figure out how to attach to the front. So that when you're sewing, somehow you'll have plenty of light. Mine has a Singer type light. It's got a little metal connection back here, plate, that fits on. Once you've cleaned everything inside here, you can put this back on. I think this bulb twists out. I bought um, a 99 a few months back, and the bulb was a push type. When you pushed it in and turned, it had a little Frankenstein bolts on the sides. They said the light didn't work. And when I pushed on the bulb to try and get it out, it came on. So I was like, great. It was like a bonus. If you need to, this screw, you can undo it. And this will come off of here. I don't know, maybe you need to replace the wiring or something's dirty in there. It's reflective back here, and while it's not very bright, it's better than no light. With these machines being black, it's like a black hole. It sucks all the light into it, and unless you have an overhead light shining directly onto it, you're going to need this until you can figure out how to find an LED bulb like me. All right, now this will set right here with your decorative faceplate over it. I don't know if that's, a, that's an access plate, not a faceplate. And you're going to put the screws in. And it's just one screw. And tighten it down. And you're going to want to put the light behind the motor. You don't want it to get caught in your cord here. Okay, now we're down to the very last part, the underside of the machine. Let me move some stuff out of the way. I always lose my oil caps. It takes me like an hour to find them when I'm done. Oh, my machine was dirty. Okay. Now very, very carefully, you want to lay this down. I have a rag back here just in case something gets scratched. First thing I want to point out to you is, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, it's a weld in the cabinet. I can't get it out. Yeah, you can. Right here is a set screw. Right here is a set screw. I have yet to see a machine that didn't have these set screws. If you can get those set screws out, and if they're sticky, put some oil on it. Let it set for a little bit. Try working with it. If it's still not moving, put a little more oil on it. I'm a big proponent of oil. Hi, Fuzzy. Come here. 
Fuzzy wants up here all of a sudden, and you have to see how cute he is. Come here. There is my tiny little dog. He likes to mark things, so he has to wear a band. <laughs> he loves his mama's lovings, don't you, Bob? Anyway, that's Fuzzy. He's little. Now he's mad at me because I put him back on the floor. Okay. Remember those forks that I told you about earlier? There's some more of them down here. Oops, that was my bottom. See, that's, that's a fork right there. And there's another one up here. I like to put a little bit of lube in those. I think that it uh, offers more protection. It also keeps it a little cleaner, I think. Sometimes you get land underneath these things, and while you pay more attention down here where the bobbin area is, sometimes you don't pay as much attention back here to cleaning it up. You can also see down inside. You can see inside the machine from down here. Like I told you before, if it moves, if it's metal on metal, oil it. There's an oiling hole in between these forks. There's a little piece of metal in there. It has an oiling hole. Put a little oil on that. I put a little oil on this joint where it moves. This gets grease. That gets grease. That's an oil hole. You're going to want to oil that. This moves, so I oil here and here. There's an oil hole here. Usually you can see the pinholes, and that will tell you where you need to oil it. These two holes here are for the top of the bed, where I told you before that the attachments hook up. Yeah, you don't need to oil that, because it's going to just run right through. And if generally, if yours is in a travel case, you're going to see the bottom of the case look kind of yucky. When I do a fresh oil on something that's brand new that I've never used before and I've oiled it really heavy, I put newspaper or paper towel in the bottom of that case after I'm done because over time it's going to drip down. Uh, the cases usually are in a condition to where they're used to having drips. I don't want to add any extra in there. So find the holes where you need the oil, the metal parts. <clears throat> that need oil. This metal part back here, these guys here, once you've done it the first time, you're not going to need to do a whole lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's the feed dogs. See how they work? Put a little oil there. Move it back and forth. When I do a really deep cleaning with oil, I move them as I oil them. I move the wheel as I oil it. Um... I can't think of anything else to tell you for this back here. I think we've just about covered it. The last thing you need to do is hook up your machine. If you have one like this, make sure you get the motor plug and the light plug plugged into the appropriate places where it will scare the crap out of you when you plug in the light to the motor or the motor to the light because then it will start sewing and sewing very fast. These machines are quick. I love them. She's a beauty. I was going to get rid of her but I don't think I want to so i got to find a name for her. So I recommend you plug it in. You run it for a couple minutes without anything in it if it still seems sluggish and I have a gimbal that I bought on eBay that uh, didn't move very well so I was a little worried that I wasn't going to be able to fix it I oiled it very well I ran it for a little bit still seemed to be stuck it has uh, ball bearings up here oh I forgot an oiling point it has ball bearings that allow just a drop of oil in the top so what I did was, I took a pin, or the something like a stiletto small enough to hold the ball down and dropped oil in it, and I'd run it for a little bit, and I'd do that again. I oiled it really well for a second time, 
and I ran the crap out of it. Eventually, it started to sew very smoothly. It quieted down. Someone had set it aside and hadn't paid any attention for decades. The machine runs beautifully now. I'm in love with her. I like to use her quite a bit. This girl I've had in storage for a while because I have been playing with the gimbal. It was her turn to come out. So I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to hook her up and play with her for a little bit today. I hope that this video helps you out. I hope it helps you figure out how to clean up your old girl. These are easy. They're hard to mess up. I have yet to have one stop sewing for anything other than a part wore out or the motor burned up. If you can replace a motor with a screwdriver, <clears throat> you've got it made. These will be a great backup machine for you and uh, last you for many, many years.